Hello, everyone. I would like to welcome you to today's Healthcare Without Harm Europe webinar on how to reduce the carbon footprint of the European healthcare sector through green procurement. My name is Gracia Trochi, and I'm Deputy Director of Healthcare Without Harm Europe. Healthcare Without Harm Europe is a membership-based, non-governmental, non-profit organization working to transform the European healthcare sector to become more environmentally sustainable and making the link between health and environment, including climate change. Um, healthcare Without Harm Europe is part of an international organization called Healthcare Without Harm that is present and active in four continents. This webinar comes on a week um, when the COP22 is being held in Marrakesh. Last Friday, I decided an event organized by the World Health Organization and the Ministry of the Environment of Morocco, Dr. Akina Elaite, has invited the healthcare sector to implement the objectives of the Paris Agreement by mitigating climate change and becoming leaders in the fight against climate change. On Monday of this week, Healthcare Without Harm organized in Marrakesh. It's a second climate and healthcare conference. At the conference, we brought together representatives of the healthcare sector from Europe and North Africa and other parts of the world to share best practices and discuss the strategies on how the healthcare sector can mitigate climate change by reducing its greenhouse gases emissions and taking leadership, a leadership role in the community they serve. Today, we are continuing this conversation with this webinar, where a specific policy for mitigating climate change will be discussed, green procurement. I would like now to welcome and introduce our three distinguished speakers. The first one is Robert Kalkevich. He is a Green Public Procurement Policy Officer at the European Commission, Directorate for the Environment. And then uh, we have also Eleni Falsteki Kluwer, she is technical expert of sustainable procurement at the National Health Service in England. And finally, Christina de Geer, environmental manager at Region Skåne in Sweden. So we will start with Robert. Robert will talk about how the green public procurement criteria that the G environment assess can help the healthcare sector reduce its carbon footprint. And by doing this, he will give an introduction of the policy framework. Thank you very much. I'll pass the floor to um, Robert. Good morning, everyone. And thanks a lot to Grazia and Healthcare Without Harm for giving me the opportunity to present our work here. I will give a brief overview on the overall work that we're doing and trying to focus at least partially on how this can be also relevant for the healthcare sector. Next slide, please. Um, to remind us, why are we all doing this? Um, green power procurement is, in my view, not a luxury, but a necessity because we are facing several environmental crises. It's not only climate change. We have a huge loss of biodiversity in other areas where it would be really a missed opportunity if we don't use the purchasing power of public procurement, which is about 14% uh, in the EU, um, to change uh, the way that uh, the market is working. So we have a couple of GPP benefits in the area, of course, of the, uh, it's mainly in the field of the environment, of course, the reduction of hazardous substances, the decrease of greenhouse gas emissions, better resource efficiency, better energy efficiency, but also social ones. If you think especially about uh, improved health and well-being when we speak about um, um, air pollution. There are also economic possibilities. We can push for a greener market, a more circular economy models in Europe and elsewhere. And politically, it's also very important for public authorities that they are doing um, what they are asking from the citizens, that they practice what they preach and are reducing their own environmental impact. Next slide, please. Um, it's easier said than done. I mean, you will find rarely a policy document where it's not said that public procurement should play a role in it, but there are obstacles to it. Um, it's very difficult to go for green public procurement if you don't have a political support. There's a perception that green products could be costing more. It's not very easy always to verify green criteria. And there is a lack of awareness of what are the benefits of green products and are the green products as good as conventional ones. 
And very often we see also that the procurement workforce is uh, not very professional and the colleagues in DG Grow of the Commission are working on that end. Uh, also very important that uh, public procurement does not always take the time to uh, plan the procedures so much in advance that you're really getting new greener products. To tackle all of this, we have developed some commission support tools. Next slide, please. It's already now eight years ago that the public uh, procurement for a better environment communication was adopted. We set back then a political target that 50% of tendering procedures should be green. We committed to develop EU GPP criteria for priority product groups. We have about 21 right now. We developed legal and operational guidance to make it easier for public authorities interested in green public procurement. And we asked member states, those who hadn't done it yet, to um, develop national action plans on green public procurement. And out of the 28 right now, we are, I think, at about 22 who have action plans with different levels of ambition. Next slide, please. Um, the GPP webpage can help you quite a lot with a lot of information if you're interested in green public procurement. On the right hand side you see the buying green guide which can be downloaded. It's also uh, translated into 22 languages. The EU GPP criteria are also with exceptions available in 22 languages. We have published more than 100 green public procurement good practice cases where you can find um, inspiration, also contacts of people who have already been successful in green public procurement. And we have a news alert. If you are interested in getting more news from us, please sign up for this. And uh, last but not least, we have a help desk. If you have specific questions on green public procurement, send it to this um, email address, which is mentioned there. It's run by our contractor, which is eClay. Next slide, please. Um, this is just an example. How our news alert looks like um, it's, uh, it's a colorful read, as you can see, but we can skip that now. Next slide, please. Um, green power procurement has um, come into a little, uh, has an increased role now with the circular economy package which was adopted in December 2005 with a move from a linear economy, next slide please, to a more circular one um, where we try to keep resources as long as possible in the, in the loop um, by prolonging the lifetime of products, making it reusable, repairable, uh, using more recycled materials in our economy. Next slide, please. And this is the mentioning of green power procurement in the circular economy package. As I said, it has to play, it's supposed to play a key role. We should um, look more at circular economy aspects in our criteria setting, which we are doing already for quite a while, but we're intensifying that right now. We want to support a greater uptake of green public procurement by public authorities, for example, by training. We will come up with new training tools, I suppose, towards the end of next year. And the Commission is also asked to lead by example in our own procurement and also in the use of green public procurement in EU funding. Next slide, please. This is just uh, an illustration of the criteria that we are having, and a lot of them are interesting for the healthcare sector. I mean, you're not only buying specialized equipment like for the criteria that we are having for the health sector, but you're also buying furniture, you're also buying computers, um, electricity, transport. Next slide, please. Um, and next slide, please. So uh, a lot of things which can be used for all kinds, in all kinds of buildings and all kinds of organizations. These are criteria which are upcoming. I don't go into detail right now, but there are further ones which could be of interest for you. Food and catering, for example, how to make your canteen more sustainable um, in, in a hospital. Next slide, please. Um, we know that public authorities are very much under pressure in these times of uh, long during economic crisis that um, you really have to take into account um, will it cost more to buy green? I mean in a couple of areas so we should not fool ourselves it will be more expensive to buy green products if you go for example for organic farming. We all know that organic products are more expensive but there's a good reason for it because of the benefits this is bringing for society. But we try to make with our green public procurement criteria calculations 
of the savings that can be done, not only in the field of greenhouse gas emissions, but also in money. And the healthcare sector was quite good because there were really a lot of differences between um, how much energy uh, an MRI scanner can use if, if it's a newer product or if it's an older product or a computer tomography. So you can really cut down the costs if you take care of that. And this is uh, the main emphasis that we looked into when we were developing our healthcare electronic equipment criteria, which have been led, by the way, by the Swedish Environmental Management Council. And we have also savings in the heating system criteria and in computers and monitors. Next slide, please. There are a lot of good examples out there, a lot of public authorities who have taken the initiative. One of the uh, most prominent ones is probably the Ökokauf Wien, Ecobuy Vienna, which have made a calculation after 15 years of their project, how many tons of CO2 they have saved, and also quite interesting for the healthcare sector is how many, how much less cleaning products have been used with equally good results, which is uh, quite important in an area because you're using in the hospitals a lot of um, materials which can be uh, rather toxic for the environment because you need to sterilize, um, have a sterile environment in a lot of areas. And they also saved a lot of money with that. Next slide, please. There is also an interesting EU project which has just finished. Um, it's called GPP 2020, which um, supported the development of over 100 green public procurement tenders with a relation to energy. And the public authorities there bought um, energy efficient equipment, they bought uh, renewable electricity. There are a lot of interesting things in it. I cannot go into detail right now. They're talking about savings of estimated 250,000 tons of CO2. This is not peanuts. Um, and normally you can assume if you're cutting down CO2 emissions, you're also cutting down energy use, which is normally translated into cost savings for the public authorities. So it has, um, it's a win-win situation in that area. And uh, next slide, please. I'm already at the end of my presentation. If you have further questions, my colleague Enrico and I are happy to answer them or at least to direct you to somebody else who could answer them. Thanks a lot. Thanks very much, Robert. And I would like to remember all participants that if you have any questions, we will take them at the end of the presentation, of the three presentations. Um, thank you very much, uh, Robert, for presenting the Commission's uh, uh, GPP criteria that I know are a major reference for public authorities in uh, setting uh, their own criteria in tendering processes, including uh, the healthcare sector. So, um, thank you. And now uh, I will uh, introduce our second uh, presenter today, uh, Mrs. Eleni Perdekis-Lua. And she will speak about how the NHS is reducing its carbon footprint. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity today to share our work. Um, as um, it's already been mentioned, my name is Eleni Pazdeki Klua. I'm a technical advisor with the uh, technical expert with the Sustainable Development Unit. And today I would like to talk to you about how we uh, in the UK, in the health and care sector, how we are tackling our environmental impacts of procurement with a specific focus on carbon. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Great. So um, a little bit about us. We are a very small team. You might see many people like, oh, like many people on the screen at the moment, but we're we actually quite a small team. Uh, the Sustainable Development Unit was founded in uh, April 2008, and we are hosted by an organization that's called NHS England, uh, but we are co-funded by NHS England and Public Health England, two organizations with a specific agreement for delivering different aspects of health in the UK. That means that we are accountable to both, and our um, responsibility is for embedding this within the wider health and social care sector, not just with hospitals, but the wider health delivery. Uh, we provide expert advice and support to the health um, and care system in England, and we report on progress with the system and also um, overall try to support the system to become more um, environmentally and socially sustainable. 
All of our work is underpinned by the sustainable development strategy. We believe that a strategic document is very helpful in guiding um, what we do. So we launch, launched our strategy in January 2014. It was approved by the Chief Executive of NHS England, so it's a really sort of high level um, of approval and Public Health England. It takes us up to 2020, so it provides a vision that will take us up to 2020. And it was coordinated by the unit, the Sustainable Development Unit. I will call it the SDU from now on, just to, 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 to be quicker. Um, it was coordinated by the SDU with support from the health and care sector, and it was on behalf of the health and care sector. So it was for the system and by the system. Can I have the next slide, please? The strategy is underpinned by um, eight modules in total, eight delivery modules. Uh, they cover specific aspects of either the delivery or the impact of sustainability in the health and care sector. And the modules are listed on the left-hand side of the slide here. There's one on commissioning and procurement. There is a slight distinction between commissioning and procurement. I'm not sure whether the same exists in your respective uh, health systems. One on carbon hotspots, where hotspots where we identified some highest emitting areas and tried to develop some approaches to tackle and manage those carbon emissions. Sustainable clinical and care models, leadership, engagement, and development. We believe very strongly that this is to be delivered. If this is to be delivered correctly, we need to have strong engagement with leadership um, and the wider uh, community within the health and care sector. Healthy, sustainable, and resilient communities metrics. So we need to be able to measure and report on, on the progress that we're making. Innovation, technology, and research and development, and also a very specific one, I guess, to the UK uh, about creating social value. These modules unpick some of the detail um, and explain in, in their for their respective areas the actions and the vision and the objectives that we have set for ourselves to take us to um, the 2020 milestone. Can I have the next slide, please? This is quite important. Um, we have set a number of expectations of the system, the health and care system. These are not mandatory as such. They're not legally binding. But we strongly expect organizations that consider themselves to be uh, well um, performing and that want to, you know, modern organizations that want to have a good approach to their responsibility, corporate social responsibility, we expect them to have these four things in place. We expect them to have a board approved sustainable development management plan, which will cover issues um, such as carbon reduction and adaptation. And we expect this to be signed off at a senior level in the organization. And as a unit, we provide guidance to the health and care sector as to how to put such a plan together. All of this guidance is available on our website for anybody to see. We expect them to be able to measure, monitor, and report on their progress and performance. And um, we develop some specific um, uh, guidance as well with regards to sustainability reporting uh, that is to be included in, in annual reports. Uh, and again, this is available for all to see. We expect them to evaluate their, their uh, performance against a recognized tool, assessment tool, and we promote a tool that we have developed, the Good Corporate Citizenship Toolkit, which is um, a set of questions divided in thematic areas uh, that are all related to sustainability. And uh, there is a scoring mechanism, so depending on the responses that organizations provide, there is, there is a score. And we expect the health and care sector and the organizations within it to do this evaluation and aim to improve their score year on year. Uh, we also expect them to engage with their staff, service users, and the public, because, like I mentioned earlier, this is something that we believe needs to be delivered collectively. Could I have the next slide, please? So every now and again, we do a carbon footprint um, calculation of the uh, total uh, health and social care system. And this is the one we did in 2012. 
we have done one since then. Uh, I think we did one last year. And the data is slightly different, but the, this diagram is quite illustrative, so I'm using it for today's presentation. But if you were looking for more recent data, that is available. And I could circulate um, links, relevant links, after this session to anybody who is interested in, in hearing more about it. So um, we did calculate the impact, the carbon footprint of um, the health and social care system. And um, this is something that always uh, presents a very interesting item for discussion because the majority of people, me included, if I wasn't aware of, of this analysis, would probably have felt that the operating uh, of hospitals and, uh, and, and the, the wider sort of uh, health establishment is quite energy intensive and that is probably the biggest contributing factor. But as a matter of fact, our analysis has demonstrated that the carbon that is embedded within decisions, procurement decisions, so within the goods and services that we source, um, is a lot more significant than the carbon that is emitted through the operation of hospitals, for example. And uh, this is really, really critical because it allows us to target this analysis allows us to target those areas that have the biggest contribution towards our carbon footprint. So yes, we are targeting our travel, and yes, we are targeting our buildings and their efficiency, but we also understand that the decisions that we make about what to buy and who to buy from and when to buy have a really, really a much bigger contribution towards our overall carbon emissions, and within those, the split, as you can see on the left-hand side, is quite significant as well because it highlights that the pharmaceuticals, the procurement of pharmaceuticals, so in other words, the carbon that is embedded within pharmaceuticals in the production line of pharmaceuticals is really quite significant. And it's one of the areas that we have focused on um, to try and reduce. So this is a very complex slide. and. In, in its complexity, it's actually quite a simplified version of how procurement actually happens in the health and social care system in the UK. At the very top, you have the Department of Health, which is the equivalent of a health ministry. They're the ones that hold the budget and the responsibility for implementing this. Then you have an organization that's called NHS England, which is responsible for managing um, commissioning uh, and commissioning decisions for NHS in England. We have a different organization in Scotland and in Wales. So um, we are only talking about what's going on in England today, not in the devolved administrations. Um, NHS England provide funding to um, organisations that we call the clinical commissioning groups, which commission health and care services through other organisations that we call the clinical support units, uh, and eventually you have hospitals delivering those services. Now, hospitals to deliver health care services to the public uh, need to have goods um, to do so, so they need to have tools, they need to have gloves, they need to have beds, they need to have the tangible things that enable them to deliver care to people. And they do that through a number of um, procurement routes. More often than not, uh, they access framework contracts through an organization that we call NHS Supply Chain, which provides um, procurement services for the NHS, the National Health System, uh, through Crown Commercial Service, which is the UK government's procurement, if you wish, uh, vehicle, through collaborative procurement hubs, which are uh, localised um, collaborative procurement organisations that provide framework contracts for others to access, through other collaborative procurement organisations, and eventually directly through with suppliers. So um, I I'm trying to communicate here that the level of complexity of tracking procurement decisions in the UK is exceptionally um, high. I don't know what it is like in other countries, but in our environment, it is very difficult to understand exactly how procurement decisions are made and to appreciate that hospitals, individual organizations such as hospitals, don't always buy their goods and services directly from suppliers who may not have that opportunity to negotiate directly with suppliers or to articulate exactly what they um, want to suppliers. More often than not, they may be sourcing through um, framework agreements, which just adds a little bit um, to that uh, complexity. Uh, 
Um, can I have the next slide, please? Okay. So um, as a unit, we are providing to support this this complex picture, to support where we can. The unit is um, developing and publishing uh, very frequently uh, support and advice on a number of different areas of sustainability and also uh, frameworks for embedding sustainability considerations within operation and procurement overall. The, amongst the tools that we have uh, at our disposal, um, are the uh, fle flexible framework of the sustainable uh, task force flexible framework that um, is, is available for anybody, uh, any organization to use, and it is a model, a maturity matrix that allows um, an organization to develop actions and track their actions for implementing sustainability through their procurement function and wider organization. Uh, the Procuring for Carbon Reduction uh, materials, which uh, provide a tool that uh, organizations can use to evaluate or to calculate better the, the carbon emissions that are associated with their procurement spend. They can also have um, access to materials that will allow them to track their progress with implementing carbon reduction initiatives through procurement. Um, and a, a number of other, there's a variety of, suite of of materials that they can use to implement carbon through procurement. There's also some um, specific um, guidelines for how to embed ethical, that is labor standards, uh, issues uh, through procurement for health, for the health sector. We also actively advocate the government buying standards, which are sustainable specifications for highly and frequently purchased products and groups of products is very, very much like the green public procurement criteria that Robert mentioned earlier. And in fact, we have um, used the green public procurement criteria for medical devices uh, in the past. And um, it is a very useful resource, I have to say. It's, it's very, I'm very pleased that the Commission is developing those guidelines. They're very useful to refer to. We also provide uh, training, and we have an online uh, package of uh, training materials that target different areas of sustainability through procurement. We regularly publish examples of good practice, such as case studies. Uh, we um, have a presence on an online procurement community, which is called the Center for Procurement Expertise. It is a um, portal for procurement officers and procurement managers from the uh, health uh, sector, from the NHS, who um, communicate. It's a bit like Facebook for adults. It has been described to me like that. So they communicate uh, openly and freely on that forum about various procurement decisions that they have to make. And we have a section there on sustainability to help them implement uh, as and when. Uh, we also have an informal mandate through a survey that we undertook uh, last year uh, in sustainable procurement. I will not focus on the results of that survey at the moment because I think I will run out of time. I think I'm fast running out of time. Um, but uh, all of these um, highlighted words are links, so anybody who would like to click through, they can uh, once the slides are available. And at the moment, we're developing an implementation strategy to bring all of these things together and provide a stronger steer to the system. Could I have the next slide, please? A little bit about um, a, an or, or um, a, a collaboration uh, that we call the Coalition for Sustainable Pharmaceuticals and Medical Devices. This is a group that was formed in 2012, and it is mostly uh, comprising uh, large pharmaceutical and medical device organizations and companies. And they have gotten together with some support from um, parts of the of the, the health uh, sector and SDU acting as a secretariat. They have come together to develop guidance on how we can reduce carbon impacts uh, in the uh, provision of pharmaceuticals because pharmaceuticals, if you remember earlier on in the presentation, I mentioned the pharmaceuticals uh, proved that they they had um, they have a, a very high contribution towards 
our carbon, our overall carbon emissions. So we felt that it would be sensible, a sensible approach, to try and target that very high emitting area uh, for reduction. So the Coalition for Sustainable Pharmaceuticals and Medical Devices has a remit to do just that, to try and focus on reducing the embedded carbon within pharmaceutical and medical devices. Next slide, please. Thank you. The coalition has developed three pieces of guidance, which I will literally whiz through because I have run out of time. They have developed internationally uh, recognized, I guess, uh, carbon footprint guidance for pharmaceutical products. So this is available, publicly available, and it's based on, on an existing protocol, on the greenhouse gas protocol. So um, anybody in the health and care sector that would like to adopt a methodology for uh, calculating uh, the carbon footprint of pharmaceutical products, they can use it. It's, it's widely available. Pharmaceutical companies that we have worked with have tried to use this, to, to adopt this, to identify the highest contributing parts of the of a product's life cycle. So, for example, um, is it the in-use phase, is it the, the disposal phase, is it the manufacturing phase that has the biggest contribution for carbon, and try to target those areas with the highest contribution to try and reduce uh, that carbon footprint. Next slide, please. Another piece of guidance that the coalition has developed, and again, is available, uh, publicly available for anybody who would like to adopt it or use it, is um, identifying from the list of pharmaceuticals that the health and care system buys, ident identifying the ones with the biggest greenhouse gas contribution and savings. So um, again, this is available for everybody to use. Can I have the next slide, please? And more recently, the coalition has published some guidance on um, how to um, calculate the environmental footprint associated with specific care intervention. So, for example, from the moment a patient comes to a uh, doctor's office to discuss a health condition, to the moment that that condition is resolved, there are many different interventions. There may be a trip to the hospital, there may be an operation, there may be a, a stay in a hospital room and on a, on a bed, there may be some actions that the patient has to do at home. So these steps in a, in a methodological way have been put together for specific types of interventions and the associated environmental footprint um, has been uh, calculated. Uh, or, or um, quantified in a way that is possible, and the results are listed in, in this guidance. Again, if anyone is interested in having a look, it is publicly available. And the next slide, please. I'm very conscious of the fact that I've focused pr pretty much on carbon, and uh, we're looking at areas beyond carbon too. So the Care Pathways guidance includes water and waste impacts in addition to carbon. Uh, the um, our ethical procurement for health policy and supporting materials uh, include um, uh, tools that can enable organisations to manage labour standards through the delivery of a of um, a contract, um, so that the the, the products that suppliers provide at least have gone through some um, assessment, if you wish, or some kind of. Uh, risk management approach to ensure that we are not exposed to risk uh, with regards to, to labour uh, abuses. Uh, there is a UK specific piece of legislation, the Social Value Act, which compels public authorities when they buy services to have due consideration and due regard to the environmental and social impacts of what they're buying and think of whether they can improve the environmental and social uh, footprint through the procurement decisions they make, and also a more recent piece of legislation for the UK, and that applies to predominantly uh, corporates, uh, that they have to provide a statement on, a, on an annual basis, a public statement, on how they are uh, managing their uh, supply chains and own operations with regards to modern slavery, ensuring that there is no slavery taking part in their management and, and operations. Can I have the next slide, please? And this is me. I'm sorry I've run over a little bit. Uh, thank you very much for listening in. Um, I know there was a lot of information, and um, I will be more than happy to share 
any of the materials that I've mentioned in, in this presentation with anybody who is interested. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eleni, for um, presenting so well the important work that the Sustainable Development Unit uh, is, uh, is doing at the NHS England. Um, I would like to remind the participants that if you have any questions so far for the first two presenters, please send them through the chat box to Healthcare Without Harm Europe, Aidan Long. Um, now, uh, from a national health system, I would like to move to a regional health system in Sweden and uh, give the floor to Christina de Gia. Um, Christina will um, present uh, how the uh, region's corner is reducing uh, the carbon footprint of the healthcare institutions there through innovation procurement. And also, she will present a new online tool uh, by uh, showing a video. The floor is yours, Christina. Thank you. Thank you very much and good morning, everyone. Today, I'm going to present good examples, such as an innovation procurement that we have worked with in our organization, Region Skåne. Region Skåne, or Skåne Regional Council, is the self-governing authority of Skåne, the southernmost county of Sweden. We serve 1.3 million inhabitants. My name is Christina de Geer and I work as an environmental strategist at the regional head office. And here you see a photo from uh, our office in Malmö. Uh, I have worked with environmental issues for over 20 years and it's a great pleasure to be invited to uh, this webinar and uh, present an innovation procurement and how we are monitoring our carbon footprint in healthcare. Today, I'm going to present a short introduction to Region Skåne, the environmental program, which has four objectives, and I'm going to focus on one of them today, fossil fuel free by 2020. Innovation procurement for a completely new product and a new web-based tool for following up carbon footprint from consumables in healthcare. And we start with the introduction. It's the political will that Region Skåne shall be a forerunner in the environmental work. The region is responsible for the region's healthcare and public transport, development of private enterprise, culture and infrastructure, as well as for the planning of our future society and of environmental and climate issues. It's Skåne's biggest employer with 33,000 employees. We have eight hospitals and the largest is Skåne University Hospital with more than 12,000 employees. We have 110 primary healthcare units, 130 dental clinics. And this is our environmental program. Already in June 2009, the Regional Assembly of Region Skåne decided that the entire organization should be free of fossil fuel by 2020, climate neutral and climate friendly. And then we have to cooperate with companies in areas of strategic property development, procurement, facility management and real estate, and also with the public transport and with our energy suppliers. Region Skåne is following up the climate impact of its activities. Already in 2001, the first major survey was carried out on Region Skåne's total carbon footprint. To ensure that the carbon footprint decreased over a 10-year period between 2001 and 2011, Region Skåne mapped the emissions coming from the businesses and in spring 2000. 13, a new survey of Region Skåne's total carbon footprint compared with the previous study. The survey found that Region Skåne's carbon footprint decreased markedly since the first analysis in 2001, for example in energy uses and transport. But there was a red spot, the consumables. We hadn't worked with them, 
and they have 40% of our total climate impact. In our um, survey of this is excluded the pharmaceuticals. So it's because of that we don't have so high like the natural health service that you already have seen. Consumables in healthcare. And we know more about uh, and study the use of disposables in healthcare. We have developed a top 10 list of products that provide high climate impact when you consume in large quantities. During the production, consumables contribute with negative climate impact depending on the material. Consumables in healthcare have a very short lifespan before they are disposed. Even though most of the waste are reused for energy production, it still has a climate impact during the combustion process. In our environmental work, we focus on specific product groups with a great, great climate impact. For example, we have seen that single-use plastic aprons, plastic rubber bags and syringes are products we use in large quantities. What are we using today? Uh, six million disposable aprons made from petroleum-based plastic each year. And what shall we do? In 2014, Region Skåne started an innovation procurement with the aim to create a new environmentally friendly aprons of renewable material. An expert group with members from purchasing, innovation, environment and regional development starting working together for this purpose. The procurement work was partially, partially financed by the Swedish Energy Agency. The region invited several vendors to create and offer a brand new product. All those who showed interest were invited to participate in a dialogue which included knowledge seminars on new material. The procurement work is unique since at it has been possible to negotiate with the suppliers throughout the procurement process. The environmental requirements were specified to stimulate the market for new climate smart materials and it should also be possible to achieve for both small and bigger producers. The new aprons consist mainly of sugar cane and lime and this major environmental initiative also means that uh, the production and new jobs are created in Sweden in Helsingborg. And during the autumn 2016 a series of samples are being tested by our healthcare employees, uh, like the nurses in the hospitals. And uh, in 2017, we will introduce this on all our hospitals with the renewable material for in the aprons. And by switching to using aprons of 91% renewable materials, we can reduce carbon emissions by over 250 tons per year. And I think this is very interesting because this you can have on uh, packages uh, when you are uh, uh, in the healthcare sector. We have asked the supplier in this innovation procurement to put on a QR code and then you can scan it with your smartphone um, and we have it on every package of the Climate Smart aprons and it gives environmental information of the product, how to recycle the aprons and packages, and how the suppliers work with the code of conduct. And I think this is a very good, sorry for this, uh, example how you could put on a QR code and you can also ask for this uh, in a contracting process when you are doing a procurement not only uh, with an innovation procurement and it, it should not cost more to put on this QR code because uh, it's very easy to do this. 
And now we move on to this new tool for following up carbon footprint to create a better awareness of cost, numbers and climate impact from consumables in healthcare, a new online tool has been developed for our leaders and employees. The online tool imports data from all our orders submitted from different units and is updated every 24 hours. And is following up statistics of cost, CO2 emissions and numbers amounts of different products are available. It's possible to make different selections of what years, months that you want to compare and also which units or department you want to look at specifically. Most data are presented as figures, which makes it easier to interpret. You can also focus on specific products and locate which areas of the hospital that mainly order this product. The first page automatically presents figures with products that have the highest CO2 emissions, number of packages and cost. Through this tool, we have selected 10 product groups with the highest CO2 emissions, about 70% of total, and focus on this to come up with solutions to mitigate our climate impact from consumables. Our goal is to work with better renewable materials for today and for the future. Thank you for your time. We have a video on YouTube that you can look at with good examples of how to use our web-based tool, keep tabs on CO2 emissions with interviews with employees from different departments within Region Skåne. And uh, thank you very much, Christina, for uh, um, your presentation on uh, the great work that Region Skåne is doing on, uh, on uh, green procurement. And um, now I would like to put some questions to the presenters. Um, I will start with Christina. Um, are hospitals happy to accept the new products uh, that you have developed to be procured? And uh, do you have a mechanism for feedback from hospital staff about the new products and how uh, they comfortable, how uh, useful and uh, about the quality of the pro product as well? Yes, uh, we have an uh, evaluation and a dialogue with the hospitals and the department who are testing the products now. So we try to um, develop the product so it gets better and better before we will introduce it for our all hospitals. So we are ev evaluating the product uh, during this autumn. And I, I also think it's unique because then um, the nurses can say if it's something that they want to have better and then we can do the product better. As a, it's a new product and an innovation product. So um, yes, uh, I really hope they will like it when we will introduce it next year. So now you are testing it in a specific uh, department? And yes, we are. Next year in the entire uh, uh, yes. Health, health, healthcare institutions in the region's corner, right? And yes, yeah. and we have also have a designer for this apron, so it's much better designed than the aprons we have used before. So I think it is a better model also. Yes, it's interesting that you had a designer designing also the apron and making it uh, comfortable for uh, for the staff. So this is uh, very interesting. Uh, thank you very much, Christina. Uh, now I would like to ask a question to Eleni. Um, how, uh, what are the main reasons for uh, pharmaceuticals having a higher carbon footprint than other products? Are you showed in the graph? Um, this is what our analysis has showed. I think the reason for the highest contribution there is the manufacturing process and the stages within that. Uh, there's also um, uh, impact during the in-use phase of products. I'll give you an example. Um, there is a particular type of inhaler. Uh, there's two, two types of inhaler for asthma patients. One is a powder, dry powder inhaler, and the other one is um, 
uh, propeller, it was like an aerosol type of, um, inhaler, and we have found that the overall carbon footprint of the um, aerosol type ones uh, is quite high because patients tend to either forget they have one or coming to the end of one inhaler and uh, replacing with the new one with more uh, material uh, in it. And those uh, canisters, the empty canisters, collectively contain quite a lot of very powerful uh, greenhouse gas uh, emissions and, and greenhouse gases really. Uh, and that contributes towards the overall carbon footprint of that particular product. So we found the dry powder inhalers are much better from a carbon perspective because they don't have that impact. Um, there isn't anything that's left in canister and it isn't such a harmful uh, gas. So for various different reasons like that, during either the manufacturing or the in-use phase, our research and analysis has shown that pharmaceuticals have the biggest contribution towards carbon emissions amongst the areas that we source, uh, the things that we buy. Thank you very much, Eleni. Um, now I have a question from the audience for um, Robert. Uh, if uh, green products are more expensive, how easy or how difficult uh, was it to, to promote uh, green public procurement criteria uh, with uh, public authorities uh, nationwide at uh, the member state level? We have heard from Eleni that that was very useful for uh, the National Health Service, but uh, have you encountered any difficulties with any other uh, National Health Services uh, systems in Europe? Um, well, I'm, I mean, I didn't say necessarily that green powder procurement is more expensive. It might be more expensive um, in some areas, clearly because of the higher inputs and the higher environmental benefits they are bringing about, but uh, often it's also only the higher upfront cost which can then be uh, recuperated after some time, especially if you look at these very energy consuming big products in the healthcare sector like MRI scanners. Um, I must say, um, we do not encounter bigger problems with national authorities because national authorities are not obliged to use them. So um, it is entirely up to them to do it and it depends very much on the individual uh, member state and on the individual public authorities to go ahead and uh, this is, I have to admit it very openly, uh, somewhat of a black spot of our green public procurement policy and our public procurement policy that uh, there are no report reporting obligations in this area. So we only have anecdotal evidence about uh, how much is this being used. There is in general a big lack of statistics in public procurement. So um, I cannot tell you too much about resistance from member states to use it. I mean, we know that some of the member states have integrated um, the criteria for the healthcare sector into their national action plans, but uh, the translation from a national action plan to a real implementation in a procurement case is partially a pretty long one. Thank you very much, Robert. I have another question for Eleni. Um, there is a lot of interest in the public procurement of pharmaceuticals in the audience today. And the question is, um, uh, what is the percentage of hospitals or health trusts in the NHS that is implementing the public procurement, uh, the guidance notes on public procurement of pharmaceuticals that you have developed? Um, we do not have such granular data, but we do have some uh, data on the implementation of uh, wider policies across hospitals and clinical commissioning groups. And I can circulate that. I don't remember it off by heart. There's probably in excess of 500 organizations in there, so I wouldn't be able to tell you. But uh, I can circulate the data to, for the audience and for the users to see which um, organizations are doing what in the health service, in the national health service and wider in, in the social uh, health and care sector. But we don't have that kind of ground information. Thank you, Lamy. Now we are coming close to the hour, so I would like to close this webinar session. I would like to thank the presenters today for their valuable contributions and for their time. Thank you so much. And um, also I would
like to apologize for the technical problems that we have experienced. Uh, the video that uh, Christina was unable to show will be uh, in the recording of the, of the webinar, so uh, we will upload it uh, in the recording. And so you will be able to view when you receive the email about um, uh, the webinar. And um, I would like to say goodbye to all of you. Uh, you will be directed to a survey. Please take two seconds to reply to the survey and then uh, also sign up to the Healthcare Without Harm Europe's newsletter if you, if you wish. Thank you so much to the presenters again and to the participants. Goodbye.